So having just landed from the overseas flight from the United States of America, my sleeping schedule is totally upside down. Uh, last night I was wide awake at midnight and tr put myself to bed, forced myself to go to bed, barely fell asleep, and then for some reason I was wide awake this morning at 5.30. And probably in about 20 minutes, right in the middle of this sermon, I'll start to get sleepy, right? Hopefully you won't start to get sleepy. But this was not only the case this morning, but it was also the case yesterday morning. And uh, I was up bright and early, up before the sun, and Violetta was sleeping away. She seems to be almost impervious to jet lag, but I don't have that gift. It's not one of the spiritual gifts that I've been given. So it takes me a long time to adjust. And yesterday morning, I woke up, and I began to hear the kookaburras calling and the whitbirds. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get up really early. I'm going to go out to the ocean. I'm just going to go out to the ocean. I'm going to watch the sun rise, and it's going to be great. And so I quietly woke up, by my definition quietly, by Violetta's definition, loud enough to wake the dead. Um, this is still a point of agreement that we have not yet arrived at in our marriage, what constitutes loud and quiet, because her loud is my quiet and vice versa. We're still navigating that. Pray for us. Pray for us. So I wake up quietly, gather my things together, get my Bible, get my binoculars, and get in the car and begin to drive down Clothiers Creek Road to the Cabo, uh, Cabarita headland. And I was trying to decide where to go. There's a number of places that I like to go. Sometimes I drive out to the end of Fingal Head and sit there out on the jetty, but I, I don't know. Something about uh, Fingal Head, I love it. I definitely love it out there, but I, it, it just feels like Coolangatta is staring at me, right? Just across the Tweed River there, there's all these apartments and high-rises, and it doesn't, it doesn't feel as nature-y as I was hoping for on this particular morning. So I thought, I'm going to go to the Cabarita Headland. So I hiked to the top of the Cabarita Headland, beautiful ocean. You could just begin to see it as the sky was beginning to turn. There was a bit of cloud cover on the horizon, so it wasn't just like a bright, radiant ball rising out of the ocean. And uh, hiked to the top of Cabarita Headland, and then I was like, you know what, I'm not going to sit here on this wooden platform. Those of you that have been up there, you know there's a wooden platform. Because I knew that joggers and fitness people would be coming up. I said, I'm going to go try to find just a little spot. And so I began to sort of make my way forward. And if you've been up there, you can wind your way down and get out to, there's a number of little rocky outcrops that you can find where you can feel like you are just totally alone, right? Because the, the shore is all behind you and the ocean is in front of you. And I, I found this lovely little spot, and I, I pulled out my Bible, and uh, I just had a sense. I, I think I took a photo here. Let me turn this on. There we go. I, I think I had just a strong sense that, that God was going to speak to me this morning. I don't know if you ever get that sense that you've woken up early, and, and you sense that God has woken you up, and you've got your Bible, and you're ready to pray. So I had this sense that this was going to be a moment. This was not going to be just like a, you know, quick devotional time that, that God was going to speak to me in a meaningful and significant way here. And I was ready to receive it, frankly. I was, I was, I felt like the new year kind of got away from me a little bit, right? I was busy preparing to go to America and didn't have, I'm, I'm a big new year guy. I love the new year. I love making new year's resolutions. I keep almost none of them, but I at least make them. And so I'm a big new year guy. And here it was like, the 10th or the 11th of January, and, and I'd kind of missed the new year, and I felt like this was going to be my new year morning. And so I sat there and watched the sun begin to do its thing, and the dolphins were coming across, and there, weren't, there were almost no waves, and so there weren't a lot of surfers, and it just felt sitting there like it was me and Jesus. It was me and God. And I opened up the Bible. Now, I don't recommend this as a, as a systematic way of studying the Bible, and I rarely do this. This is not like uh, a normal way that David Asherick studies the Bible. I tend to be a very systematic person, very organized person when it comes to Bible study. So I don't recommend you just open up the Bible and say, God, whatever I land on, that's your word for me today. You've probably heard the cute little thing where somebody tried to study the Bible that way, and they opened up the Bible, and it said, Judas hung himself. And they're like, well, that's not what I was looking for. So they closed the Bible, and they opened it up again, and it said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> like, man, this is just a terrible morning for, you know, terrible morning devotions. So they closed the Bible. They said, I'm going to give this one more time. They opened it up, and it said, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> right? So it's not an advisable way to study the Bible, but there have been times in my life where I have just felt under the impress of the Spirit that God was going to speak to me wherever I landed. Because I mentioned here I'm a little late to the new year, I didn't have like my reading plan set out. I didn't, I didn't yet know what the next sermon series was for the church, and so I was kind of directionless, right? I just was there with Jesus. Sun is rising. I've got my Bible. I've got my binoculars in case something fly, exciting flies by or the dolphins go by or whatever it might be. 
And so I just had this sense, and I was like, Lord, I'm going to open up my Bible here, and um, I just want you to speak to me as a father. I just want you to speak to me as my God. Uh, I'm not this isn't, I'm not looking for you to perform a magic trick here. I'm not holding your feet to the fire for some kind of a sign. I just, there's so much in this Bible that would be so relevant to my situation right now. I just totally trust that you're going to do something really special here. And so I just opened my Bible and just sort of flipped through a few pages and then just stopped on this page, okay? And this was the verse that my eye fell on. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. I was like, thank you, Lord. You are so good, right? On the same day, David went out of the house and he sat by the sea, right? So I, I was thinking about this this morning, when I, or, or, or that morning, when I opened up the Bible and it was just like, it was almost like a little miracle. God just worked this little sign for me, right? I could have opened any verse in the Bible. And while I don't recommend this as a systematic or organized way to study the Bible, it certainly was a moment where God, by his tender f spirit and his fatherly care, just reached down and said, David, we're going to have a conversation, we're going we're gonna to have a chat here. I'm going to minister to you, and you're going to pray, and you, you're going to spend some time here. And I spent the better part of the next two hours sitting on that rock, just, just reading, absorbing, and trying to hear God's message for me this morning. And, and I, I, I asked myself this question, what does it take for God to get your attention? Right? Is that what it requires? I mean, on most mornings when I open my Bible, I don't get anything like that. I don't get this like cute little definitive idiosyncratic sign, right? Some little mini miracle. That doesn't typically happen. But, but this morning it did. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if that happened every morning, if, if that would be an easier way for God to get my attention. How is it that God gets my attention? Is, is his word enough to get my attention or do I need a little trick? Do I need God to pull a rabbit out of the hat? Do I, do I need a little dog and pony show in order for the word to mean a little more, to matter a little more, to get me out of bed in the morning? And as I was reflecting on that, the Spirit spoke to me and the Spirit said this to me, David, what does it take for the phone to get your attention? And the answer is precious little, right? This is all the phone needs to do to get my attention. Blah. How many people can relate to that? You're in the midst of some task, you're in the midst of something, and, and your phone is sitting there, right, minding its own business on the table, or maybe it's in your pocket, and you're, you're absorbed in a task, you're absorbed in something, and then all of a sudden, and, and instinctively, again, like a Pavlovian, you don't think, you know what, right now I'm in the midst of something, I'll check that later. Now occasionally you do, but let's be honest. For those of you that are smartphone owners and smartphone users, when that little, or maybe for you it's not on vibrate mode, maybe it's a ding, maybe it's a chime, maybe some little signal, you, you, you just instinctively reach, you just grab it, right? You just grab it. And I was reflecting, and I think the Spirit of God was speaking to me and saying, David, that's the level of attentiveness that I want you to have to me. When there's just the smallest hint, the littlest whisper, the smallest spiritual vibration that you, you, you don't second guess it, you just reach for it. You reach for the word, you reach for prayer, you reach for me, that there's this instinctive reaction, right? For me, I don't know how it is for you, but often it's, it's a bit of an episode to get ready. It's a bit of an episode to get up and get my Bible and drink, and I've got to use the restroom and brush my teeth, but almost nothing can interrupt my relationship with my phone. I'm grabbing. Ding, I'm grabbing. But what if it was just as easy, just as in, in reflexive, and just as instinctual for God to get my attention? The moment there was just a little whisper, a little moment, a little glimmer of opportunity to speak to God, to hear from God, to, to be with God, that I just would reach, just instinctively, just in the moment. What does it take for God to get your attention? And as I was sitting there on the seashore and God had given me this little mini miracle with Matthew chapter 13 verse 1, it dawned on me that God is always available. Can somebody say amen? It's not like God was suddenly more available that morning because I woke up and because I prayed and because I had jet lag and I opened up the Bible. Now, now God is a little more available than he would otherwise be. No, actually what had happened was I was more available to the situation. God had been there every day of my life and every day before I was ever born. God is perfectly, always, totally available for just these kinds of interactions. So the question is not God's availability to speak, to minister, to, to give his fatherly care and compassion. The question is, am I available? 
I'm available to my phone, I'm available to my email, I'm available to my Instagram, I'm available to my social circle, I'm available to a great many things. Am I available to God? Or is it just kind of one of those things that happens every now and then? You know, you get up early, you're suffering from jet lag, and uh, this is going to be a moment. Right now, me and Jesus. Now, you might have heard this before, and it is admittedly a little cliche and a little platitudinous, but it's also true. And that is that God does not need your ability as much as your availability. What God is looking for is not so much what you bring to the table, but that you come to the table at all. Now, it doesn't have to be as dramatic as I've described this morning with the sun rising and getting up early before that and, and sitting down and having your binoculars and awaiting the arrival of the dolphins and having a little mini miracle in the opening of the text. It doesn't have to be that. It can just be that you make yourself available with regularity, with consistency, that, that God is your Father and you are available to Him, aware and conscious of the fact that He is always, ever available to you. Luke chapter 19, verses 3 to 5 is not a passage that we're going to look at today, but this is the passage from which we get our sermon title. Our sermon title today is simply, The Place. Just The Place. And that is going to come from a few different passages, but, but this one in particular. I don't know why, but years ago when I was reading the story of Zacchaeus and how he was too short and he couldn't see over the heads of the people and he ran and climbed up the sycamore tree, a familiar story, when I was reading through that story, the, the definite article, the, jumped out at me. And I want you to hear that today. It's Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 3. Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus, uh, who he was. But he could not because of the crowd, because he was of short stature. So, so Zacchaeus says, man, Jesus is there. Jesus is available. I'm going to go see this guy, Jesus, this provocative, young, exciting rabbi. So Zacchaeus ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree for he was going to pass that way. Zacchaeus made a calculation. He said, okay, I see where he's heading this way. I know this town well. There's no lefts off of this street. So if I climb up this tree right here, Jesus will come by. So what Zacchaeus done here is, done, has done here is he's made himself available. He has positioned himself for an interaction. That's what I did uh, two mornings ago. I positioned myself for an interaction and unsurprisingly, God did not disappoint me. Zacchaeus has positioned himself for an interaction. He has, he has oriented his life so that he's available when Jesus shows up. I guess that's my question for you and me. Have we positioned our lives so that when Jesus shows up, we're available? Because in fact, Jesus is always able and willing to show up. And here's the the that I was speaking about. Verse 5. So Zacchaeus, uh, very next verse, verse 5 says, work with me here. And when Jesus came to, what are those next two words? The place. That's our sermon title this morning. When Jesus came to the place. Not just any place, not a place, not the indefinite article, but when Jesus came to the place. The place of Zacchaeus' availability. Jesus was going to come to that place whether or not Zacchaeus is in the tree. If Zacchaeus is not in that tree, Jesus is still going to walk by that tree. This was the place made all the more important as the place because Zacchaeus had made himself available to Jesus. And so it says, when he had come to the place, he looked up and saw him and he said to them, I love this. There's no indication previous in the text that Jesus knows Zacchaeus. There's no, there's no indication. It doesn't mean that they hadn't met, but there's no textual indication within Luke that they had met. And, and he looks up into the, the tree, and he says the same thing that he says to you and me, except he doesn't say Zacchaeus. He says Courtney. Right? He looks up into that tree, and he says Tim. He looks at that rocky headland, and he says Agnes. He looks in that early morning bedroom, and he says Carolyn. He speaks our name. Friends, I want you to know today, the God of the universe knows your name. And when you meet him at the place, he makes himself available for your availability. Look at this. When he came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said, Zacchaeus, hey, hurry up and come down for I'm going to stay at your house tonight. Jesus would have walked by that tree if Zacchaeus wasn't going to be there, but Zacchaeus positioned his life. He organized, he calculated, and he made himself available in the place. The place. We're going to come back to that. All right. In, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, we see Jesus making himself available. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. That's the verse that jumped out at me there. 
Verse 2, and a great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into the boat and he sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Okay, Jesus' popularity is increasing for a variety of reasons that Matthew is already spelling out for us in his gospel. But Jesus has made himself available on a shore. It seemed like a reasonable place to be. There was, you know, open air, a bit of an amphitheater. But so many people came to hear Jesus. What it would look like if you were an external observer seeing this scene, seeing the situation, you would say, wow, these people are making themselves available to Jesus. Man, these people are coming. They want to hear the word of Jesus. They want to hear the teachings of Jesus. These people have made themselves available. Well, of course, the reason they've made themselves available to Jesus is that Jesus has first made himself available to them. Jesus is there. He's on the shore. He is awaiting an encounter. And so Jesus is there, and the multitudes gather together to him. This is also a little platitudinous and slightly cliche, but it's also absolutely true. If it's important, and this goes for anything in your life, including but not limited to making that appointment at the place with Jesus, if it's important, you will make a way. And if it's not important, you will make an excuse. Right? This is true of anything. If, if being fitter in 2018, if that's a goal of yours, I want to be more fit, I want to lose weight, I want to increase my flexibility, I want to increase my strength, if that, if that is on your docket for 2018, if you're like, man, that's, that's a, if that's important to you, if it's really important to you, you, you'll figure it out. You'll make a way. If it's somewhat important or marginally important or passingly important, you will probably make an excuse. Zacchaeus didn't just make Oh, he, didn't, he didn't just say, well, you know, maybe I could meet Jesus at some other place. No, this was important. It was important for Zacchaeus to see Jesus, so he made a way. These people have come out and they've met with Jesus on the shore. They're, they're making themselves available to him. So this is Ellen White from Christ's Object Lessons. Speaking about the parable of the sower, she says, because of its simplicity, the parable of the sower has not been valued as it should be. From the natural seed cast into the soil, very simple, Christ desires to lead our minds to the gospel seed, the sowing of which results in bringing us back to God. Now, let's read this story here. Let's just read the parable of the sower. You might be familiar with it. We're actually not going to dive too deep, but we're going to dive just deep enough to make the larger point that I want to make, and that's coming up. So verse 3. He then spoke many things to them in parables, saying, and in Matthew chapter 13, there's something like seven parables, okay? So seven parables, this is the first of the seven. Behold, a sower went out to sow. Look, somebody went out to sow seed in an agrarian situation, in an agrarian economy. This would not have been unusual. A guy went out to sow some seed. This happened a lot. Probably most of the people to whom Jesus was speaking had at some point in their lives sowed seed. If it was, if it was time for, for planting, probably many of them had sowed seed that week or that month. And it's not difficult to figure out what Jesus is saying here. Just remember, the, the crowd is so big, Jesus has made himself available on the beach, and he thought that would be sufficient space, but so many have come that he's gotten into a boat, and now there's lots of people there. So many people that Jesus is now in a boat, and he says, look... Behold, a sower went forth to sow. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He is the sower. And he's going to sow, not literal seeds in literal soil. He's going to sow his words in the hearing, in the ears of those who are seemingly available. They've showed up. They are apparently available. They are seemingly available. I mean, they are standing on the beach after all. The Bible says there was a great multitude. Lots of people came out to hear the words of Jesus. And so Jesus pushes back and he says, look, a sower went out to sow. Now they might have thought of, of a literal sower sowing literal seed in literal field. And Jesus is going to use that analogy here. But there's no question that Jesus is referring to himself. He is about ready to cast his word, cast his teachings, cast his parables into the ears, into the hearing, into the consciousness of these crowded masses on the beach. And he tells this story, verse 4. And he sowed some seed. And some fell by the wayside, and birds came and devoured those seeds. And some fell on stony places where they didn't have a lot of earth. And immediately they sprang up because they did not have depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. 
And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. The sermon that I preached on this about a year ago on Matthew chapter 13, I was privileged to be able to preach on Matthew chapter 13. Jared had, I think, 14. But I, I called that sermon, What Are Those Things on the Side of Your Head? Right? And of course, they're ears. Ears are on the side of our head. Right? And Jesus says, if you have ears, which I remember inviting all of us to check. Most of us seem to have ears. It, Jesus says, if you have ears, I want you to hear this story. This is a story about a guy who was absolutely gracious. He was munificent. He was generous. Apparently even a little wasteful with his seed distribution. Man, he was just casting it everywhere. I mean, he's, just, he's just almost prodigal with the sowing of the seed. And he just throws the seed and he says, some lands by the wayside. And some landed on some rocks, some, some, some stony places, and some of those landed kind of among the thistles and the thorns, but, but some of those seeds landed on good soil, right? Now, this is Jesus telling his story. He then goes on to say, well, the ones that fell by the wayside, they were devoured by birds. And the ones in the stony place, now, that was problematic because there wasn't a lot of earth there. And the ones that fell among the thorns, well, they got choked out because the, the thistles and the, and the weeds required the water, and they got choked out. They didn't survive. But, but the good soil, he's like, man, the stuff that fell on the good soil produced fruit. Some produced 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. And so the people there, just imagine yourself on that beach, and you're hearing these words, and you're thinking, what kind of a Messiah is this? Uh, what kind of a Messiah is this? We're looking for a military Messiah. We're looking for a Messiah that's going to rally the troops. We're looking for a Judas Maccabeus-style Messiah. Judas Maccabeus, of course, is the Jewish uh, leader who in the second century B.C. led a significant Jewish revolt against the pagan overlords and secured a century of Jewish independence before Rome finally came along. And so what Judas Maccabeus had begun, they're looking for somebody else to come and complete. Judas Maccabeus got us a good start, but we're looking for somebody even stronger than the hammer. That's what he was called, the hammer. We're, we're looking for somebody stronger than that. And here's Jesus in a boat, seated, and he's like, let me tell you a story about a sower. And you can almost begin to feel at some level the impatience of the people. Not just the impatience of the people, but as the text goes on, even the impatience of the disciples. Now, Jesus is available to the people. There he is. He's available. But are they available to him? And the answer is, by external indication, yes. Those people are there. They're on the beach. They're hearing his words. But Jesus seems to be telling a parable specifically to point out that not everybody is as available as they appear. Right? You're here hearing and a sower went forth to sow. I'm sowing my seed. I'm teaching my teachings. I'm telling my stories. I'm giving my parables. But some of these parables are falling in stony ground. And some of these teachings are falling among thorns. I, I know that it looks like, man, I'm going to be really popular. Look at all the masses of people lining up to see me. But only some of these seeds are falling on good ground. Jesus is available. He's always available, always has been, always will be from this day forward for the rest of your life. That's not the question. What's in debate here, what's under a scrutiny here is not God's availability to you or to me or to anyone else in the world. The question is your availability to God. Are these people as available to God as they appear to be? Well, I suppose the next question then, Jesus is available to you. Are you available to him? Not episodically, not occasionally, not every now and then, but, but routinely, in the same way that you're available to your phone, in the same way that you are available to the things that occupy your attention. Maybe you're here and you're over 60, you're over 50, and you don't have a smartphone and you don't care about Instagram and you're not into Facebook, but, but what is the thing that has your attention? Whatever that thing is, are you as available to God as you are to that thing or those things? That's really the question. And so Jesus tells a story that seems calculated to identify and to diagnose the actual unavailability of people. Now that kind of raises a question. 
What does it mean to be available to God? Psalm 139 says that you cannot flee from God's presence. Right? The psalmist says, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there. Where shall I flee from your presence? So it's kind of weird to talk about being available to God since God is ubiquitous, since God is omnipresent. He's available to every one of us right now. So what does it mean to be available to God? Well, it can't mean to be physically alive. It must mean to be emotionally engaged, mentally engaged. It, it must mean to be tuned in to God. It can't just be to be present and accounted for in the same way that some of you here today are present and accounted for, but, but you're not available to the message. You're not available to the message because you're distracted. You're not available to the message because you think, man, this guy, he's talking too long. You're not available to the message because you didn't put your phone on airplane mode, which should be called church mode in my opinion, right? So, so you're present, and in an analogous way, the same way that we are sometimes present to church, many of us are present to God. We're there, we showed our face, but were we available? Like, were we the stony ground availability? Were we the thorny ground availability? Or were we the good soil availability? What does it mean to be available to God? Well, fortunately for us, we don't have to wonder because Jesus is going to tell us. Jesus is actually going to tell us what this availability looks like. You can fast forward to verse 18. Matthew chapter 13, fast forward to verse 18. Jesus is now going to explain the parable, something he didn't usually do. I should say didn't often do. He would tell parables and often he would just let them hang out there with all of their mystery and all of their seeming ambiguity. He just let them sort of sit out there so people would ruminate on them and stew on them. But on some occasions, Jesus actually said, okay, 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 let me tell you what it means. All right, let me tell you what the stony ground means and what the thorny ground means and what the wayside means and what the good soil means. So verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Let me explain this to you guys. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom but does not understand it, does not, what's the word, everyone? Understand it. That's going to be a key idea here. In fact, that word understand comes up again and again and again in Matthew chapter 13. So Jesus says, if somebody hears what I'm saying but does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside, the devouring birds. The devouring birds are not literal birds that come and peck away the sermon from your mind or peck away the text from your mind or whatever it might be. No, it, the, the devouring birds are that you didn't understand it. You missed it. You missed the point. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Verse 20. But he who received the seed on the stony places, he, this is the one who hears the word, and man, he immediately receives it with joy. That sounds like such good news. Verse 21, but he has no root in himself. He endures only for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So there's an impermanence to, to the plant, right? It, it, it springs up quickly and there's a lot of joy, but it doesn't endure. Persecution arises, difficulty, adversity arises, and the plant fades, right? Not much soil, no depth, no substance, no solidity. Verse 22, now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, notice everybody hears, who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Now, now it's important to recognize, just quickly read verse 23, and then I'll make my point. But he who received the, the, the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word. It's fascinating. Everybody hears. And what Jesus means by that is everybody has functioning ears, right? Like their auditory signals are being received and they are at some level being transmitted to the brain. He's like, this wayside heard, the stony places heard, the thorns heard, the soil heard. So the difference between them is not a lack of hearing. Jesus says the difference is a lack of understanding. Look at verse 23. But he who received the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and, and what? Understands it. Indeed, he bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, the point of demarcation, the point of differentiation is not, a, I'll just say it this way, a shallow level of availability. All the people standing there crowded on the shore, they are available at some level, right? 
There's, there's some sense in which they're available because Jesus says everybody heard. They were all within earshot. They, could all, they all heard the message. But only one understood the message that they heard, which raises the question, why? Why did only some understand? Check, check this out. The wayside does not understand. Stony places, no deep roots. Among thorns, worldly cares and riches. And the good soil understands. The point that Jesus is making here is a point about understanding. Not just a point about hearing in terms of auditory vibrations coming into your you know, inner ear and your cochlea and all of that. There's something else going on here. Every one of us knows this, my wife probably better than any person in this room, that someone can be present and listening but not hearing. Are you with me? Is that true, babe? Yeah, she's been married to it for 18 years, right? Present in terms of bodily present, and even my ears are open, but she'll be talking and all of a sudden she'll say, did you hear a word I said? I'll say, yeah, I heard everything you said, and I'm technically telling the truth. And she'll say, what did I say? And now I'm scrambling. I'm like, you said really important things, <laughs> right? And sometimes I'll just take a guess. I'll say, you said we need to talk to Jabel. And she's like, yes, exactly. I'm like, whoa, I won the lottery. I got luck. Usually I don't. Usually I'm like, I'm sorry, babe. I was listening. But she said, you weren't paying attention. So I was listening, but I didn't have understanding. She never does that, by the way. She's a perfect wife. She never does that. Now that kind of raises the question, if there's a lack of understanding, whose fault is that? It, it, whose fault is that? Well, if there's a lack of understanding, say, educationally, we would often look to the teacher. We would say, hey, how come my child doesn't understand this? Right? There's like this, almost this onus of responsibility, like, did you teach this as well as you could have? Right? Well, why is there a lack of understanding? It almost seems like maybe Jesus bears some responsibility for the lack of understanding. I mean, the sower is the, the one that put the seed on the stony ground and among the thorns and on the wayside. So, so if there's not understanding, is that Jesus' fault? Well, it's kind of interesting. Jump back now to verse 10. Jump back to verse 10. Verse 10. Then the disciples came to him and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Which was a fair question. It was unexpected. And frankly, it was unwelcome. This is not what the disciples were looking for. It certainly isn't what the mixed multitude was looking for. They were looking for a sword-wielding, card-carrying member of the military Messiah club. And so, a, a, you know, an itinerant, nomadic, homeless, quasi-hippie, rabbi walking around the Galilean countryside talking about sowers sowing seed is not what anybody's looking for, right? This is not, that doesn't fit. So the disciples, you almost sense their frustration, right? There's a mild frustration here. They're, you kind of almost hear them in the subtext saying, Jesus, how are we ever going to get this message out if you're speaking a language that no one understands? That's like sort of implicit in the text. Jesus, no offense. You're the Messiah. We're the followers of Messiah. But but why are you talking like this? Why are you talking in these strange, enigmatic stories about sheep and weddings and yeast and nets and mustard seed and sowers? Well, what are you talking about? Why are you talking in parables? Let me translate that for you. Why aren't you being more clear? There's not a person in this room who has not asked the very same question of God at some point in their life. God, why aren't you being clearer? Am I wrong or am I right? Some situation, some circumstance, some difficult eventuality happens and you're like, God, wh what are you doing? This is not clear. Can't you be clearer? Which is frankly an indictment against God. Let's be honest, it is. Job had this indictment. The psalmist often had this indictment. And so why should we be surprised that the disciples here have the same indictment? Why are you speaking in parables? Can we turn the clarity volume up and the mystery volume down? Right? Many of us in this room have cried out for the very same thing. God, was that a sign? Was that a symbol? Was that an opportunity? Was that a providence? Is that an open door? Could you just tell me what to do? Make it 
clearer. Which gets back to our question about, well, if there is lack of understanding, whose fault is it? Implicit within the narrative, you almost get this idea that, that it's Jesus' fault that some are on thorny ground and some are on stony ground and some are by the wayside. Verse 10. The disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Translation, why aren't you being clearer? Is God playing favorites here? It kind of seems like it. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 11. Then he answered and said to them, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. Well, now that is an unexpected answer, let's be honest. Right? The disciples are like, why are you talking in parables? And Jesus' answer is, well, because to you it is given to understand, and to them it's not given. There's no other way to read this except some sort of like quasi-favoritism. Like, I'm telling you, but I don't want them to get it. Because I like you a little better. I like you a little more. But in fact, that's not what's happening here. It raises the question, what is the difference? Here's that big crowd on the, on the, on the beach. And there are 12 disciples scattered among the crowd. To an external observer, the disciples blend in nicely, just like everybody, they look like everybody else, right? All of these people are available to hear the words of Jesus. All of these people are available to be followers of Jesus. But Jesus tells a parable in which he says, actually, that's not true. There's lots of people here available physically, but they are not present to the situation. You, however, Jesus says to his disciples, you're in a different situation. What separated the disciples from those that they looked, frankly, very similar to? And the answer is that they were followers of Jesus. Because many observe, but fewer follow. When Jesus says, to you it is given to understand the mysteries, he's not saying, I like you more or I like you better. What he's saying is, is you left those boats, you left the tax collector's table, you followed me when I gave the invitation, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. When I gave the invitation, you came. All of these people here on the shore are not largely interested in following. Some of them are, but most of them are observers. Many observe, but many fewer actually follow. Many are interested, but many fewer are invested. When Jesus says, to you it is given to know the mysteries, he's not playing favorites. What he's saying is, is you're going to understand more than the casual observer who shows up for a moment to hear a story from this provocative young rabbi. Similarly, those of you that just show up to church hoping to hear a good sermon from that fast-talking, long-preaching American preacher, you might get blessed, but you might not. You might leave and say, that was a terrible sermon. Man, I was hoping for something much better than that. But I'll tell you this. If you show up as a follower of Jesus, if you show up passionate about his kingdom, passionate about the word, if you show up not just physically present, but present to the spirit, you will absolutely leave blessed, even if the preacher just stands up and sneezes and coughs. Because you're not just an observer. You're present to the situation. You're open to the spirit. You're not stony ground. You're not thorny ground. You're not the wayside. You are not just present physically. You are present to the situation spiritually. You are available Look at this, John chapter 7, verse 17. Jesus said, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. This is fascinating what Jesus says here because he reverses the order that we typically would understand. So I'll just give you a little different translation here, a more modern translation. It's easier to understand. Jesus says, if you really want to obey God, you will know if what I teach comes from God or from me. This is a reversal of the way that we typically understand this. What Jesus says is, if you want to know the truth, start obeying. He doesn't say, start obeying when you know the truth. Because, and these three words can change your life. Understanding follows obedience. Those three words right there change your whole life. Understanding follows obedience, not the other way around. This is why the one that understood the good ground was, 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 was different and separate from the others who did not understand. 
This is why Jesus says to you it's given to understand because you, though not perfectly, you have chosen to follow. You are, insofar as it's possible for you right now, you are obedient to the call, and in responding to the call, you have made yourself available to me, and so you're going to hear things that others are not going to hear, even though they're going to hear the very same verbiage. They're going to sit in the very same room. They're going to be exposed to the very same presentation, but you are going to hear something that others may not, because you have obeyed, and understanding, and insight, and perspicacity will follow obedience, not the other way around. This is also true. Ability follows availability. I tell you, one of the most frustrating things about pastoring this church, and I don't know if this is something that is idiosyncratically Kingscliff or if this is an Australian thing because I, this is the only church I've ever pastored. But, but this, is the, this is the response that nominating, nominating committee gets again and again and again and again if you're calling and asking for someone to lead out in something. So you call up, you have the conversation, you have prayer, and the response, not always, but a, a disproportionately high percentage of the time is... I would love to be involved, but I won't lead. I'd love to be involved, but I, I won't lead. 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 And I don't, I don't know. If, is it a timidity? Is it the tall poppy thing? Is it just general busyness? I don't know. I, 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 it would be too difficult to diagnose why it is that 300 people or 350 people are suddenly not available to lead something that they are available to participate in. But, but I sometimes wonder if it's that people feel un underqualified. They just feel like, I'm, I, I, I'm not a leader. I, how could I ever lead? I would have to be trained. I would have to be equipped. I, I, there's a lot of stuff that would have to happen in order, in order for me to be a leader. But I'm just going to go out on a l limb here and say that, in fact, if you make yourself available to God in some capacity that stretches you, God will make up the difference. God will make up the difference. If you make yourself available to God, the ability will follow the availability. The understanding will follow the obedience. Matthew chapter 13, verse 12. This is the verse that sounds like favoritism. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And, who, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have... What he has will be taken away from him. Man, this sounds terrible. This is just another one of those weird things that Jesus said. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Right? Look, look at this. Whoever has, man, we're going to give more to the guy that has it. And he's going to have a lot. And the guy who doesn't have any, even the little bit that he has is going to be taken away. This is, frankly, this sounds like crazy talk. Until you ask this question, whoever has what? Understanding. So we're just going to do something really clever here. We're just going to drop the word understanding in in all of the places where it's implied. And we see that what Jesus is saying is not prescriptively I'm playing favorites, but what he's describing is the way reality works. Look at this. For whoever has understanding, to him more understanding will be given, and he will have abundant understanding. But whoever does not have understanding, even the little understanding that he has will be taken away from him. Th this makes such good sense. If you just think about a, a, a child who's learning and going through the process, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, right? And we know that they're going to be reading books in the 10th and 11th grade that will require that they learn to read back here in these earlier grades, okay? But if, if they have a little understanding here, that little understanding of how a, a, a cat ran, ran th through, th through, through, the house. A cat ran through the house, okay? Exactly. So you, you, you have a little understanding, but cumulatively that little understanding becomes a great understanding when you get down to this end. But if you don't have a little understanding, if you look at those symbols and you don't, under, you don't know it, whether it's math or English or science, and then you come down here, the little bit that sort of made sense back there makes no sense now. So too with Jesus. Jesus is like, look, if you obey, if you make yourself available, if you follow, your understanding will increase those that make themselves available to me, those that follow, those that obey, man, your understanding is going to be, you're going to have so much understanding. And those that do not do that, the little bit of, un I'm going to say things that are going to be completely mystifying to them and they're going to tune me out. The little bit of understanding that they could have when they were standing on that crowded sh seashore will be taken away from them. Not because Jesus plucks it away, but because they're like, ah, nah. They're available, but they're not fully available.
Because the understanding that Jesus is talking about here is not about intelligence. Jesus is not divvying up IQ here. Well, you're going to be like a 97, you'll be a 123, I'm going to give you a 154, I'll give you a 111, and you get a 33. Right? right? Is, uh, Jesus is not divvying up IQ here because, because the understanding that Jesus is, is inviting us to have, the understanding that Jesus is describing in the parab parable of the sower, is not a level of intelligence. Hey, you're going to be a little smarter, you're going to be not quite as smart. And the person that's No, it's about availability and obedience. Understanding increases as availability increases, and understanding increases as obedience increases. Obedience. Obedience to the invitation of Jesus to follow me. Obedience to the invitation of Jesus to come unto me, all the labor. Uh, actual obedience to an actual Savior brings about an actual increase in understanding. A mere, a mere familiarity with a guy named Jesus of Nazareth, a casual, episodic, f flirtatious relationship with Jesus results in zero understanding. The little understanding that you have will be taken. I love, it. I love saying it this way. To understand, you must first stand under. Do you want to understand the mysteries of God? Do you want to understand the mysteries of his word? You must first stand under the truth of God. Stand under the fatherly care of God. And when you stand under by availability and by obedience, then you will begin to understand things that others who do not stand under will never understand. Jesus then does this. He quotes Isaiah 6. Verse 13 of Matthew 13. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they don't see. Yeah, they saw me on the seashore, but they didn't see. And hearing they don't hear. Yeah, they heard me, but they didn't. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And then Jesus says, you know what this is? These people that are all standing on the seashore? He says, this is actually a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. And he quotes here from Isaiah 6. Hearing you will hear. This is Isaiah. Hearing you will hear, but will not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive or understand. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. In fact, you notice here verse 15, there's a chiasm. I put it up here on the screen for you. Notice how, notice how this goes. Okay, it's a chiasm. A, B, C, C, B, A, right? It's a poetic structure. So watch this. The hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Right? Hearts, ears, eyes. Now watch what he goes. Lest they should see with their eyes... Hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. So this is classic chiastic parallelism. A, B, C, C, B, A. He's like, there's a problem here. The problem is they're hearing, but they're not hearing. They're seeing, but they're not seeing. Their heart is open, but they're not understanding. Now this is the coolest thing. This is the punchline of the whole sermon. So if you've survived it to this point, you're about ready to get the big payoff. The temptation in hearing a sermon like this would be like, man, the pastor's right. I need to get my act together. I need to, I need to spend more time in Scripture and less time watching movies and playing board games and being a, you know, stuck on my phone. He, he's right. He's right. You know, this is a new year, new me. I need to, yeah, I'm going to turn up the volume on my spirituality. I'm going to turn down the volume on my worldliness, and I'm going to reorient my priorities here. The, the pastor's right. This is a great point. God's been available to me. I've not been available to him. And so my response is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that. But what's fascinating is what Isaiah, what God says through Isaiah and what he says here. What he says is, return and be healed. Healed? Yeah, you need to be healed. Uh, what do you mean I need to be healed? Yeah, you're sick. The, the, the word in the Greek, I, I checked it again this morning, it, it's, it's like to be healed from a disease. Y you have a disease. And your disease is not just that you have a lack of resolution or that you're lazy or that you're a procrastinator. You have a much bigger disease. You have a really big disease. And, and what he says is, you've got a problem with your ears, your eyes, and your heart. You've got heart disease. You've got ear disease. You've got eye disease. And you don't need more resolve. 
What you need, he says, is to return and be healed. You, you need the touch of the hand of God. You need to return. Now, I love that. Return means to come back to that place you used to occupy. You, you can't return to a place you never were. You can only return to a place you have formerly been. And so what Isaiah says and what Jesus says here, he says that, that they, should, they should turn and I would heal them. When I sat there on the end of that headland at Cabarita, the Spirit of God spoke to me as I was reading through the parable of the sower and I was like, I, I, didn't have, I had no intention to preach this. I was just reading. I was just reading devotionally. I was just spending this thoughtful moment with Jesus. I just was making myself available to him. And do you know what the Spirit of God spoke to me? The Spirit of God said to me, David, you need to return and be healed. David, you've got an ear problem. David, you've got an eye problem. And David, you've got a heart problem. You need to return to me and be healed. To which I responded and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I need to return where? Where? Where, where do I need to return to? Because, because I, I think I've been with you the whole time, Jesus. I, I was baptized June 6, 1996, and, and I've been with you the whole time. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, now you need to return. You need to return to the place. Just like Zacchaeus came to the place. Fascinatingly, in Isaiah 6, which we have no time to develop, Isaiah came to the place he made himself available at the place. And, and when God asked the question in Isaiah 6, who shall we send and who will go for us? Isaiah says, here I am. I, here I am. I am available. Send me. This is the famous passage that we have in the Old Testament. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Isaiah 6. Because he, he went to that place. Well, in the case of Isaiah, it was the sanctuary. And in the case of Zacchaeus, it was the sycamore tree. And in the case of the disciples, it was wherever Jesus went. And in my case, it was the Cabarita headland. It was the place where you come and realize that you don't just need to get your act together. You need to be healed. And some of you used to go to the place. You were first converted, freshly converted, on fire. There was this primitiveness to your walk with Jesus. There was this like simplicity to your walk with Jesus. Man, look at this. Ellen White from Ministry of Healing. When temptations assail you, when care, perplexity, and darkness seem to surround your soul, go to the place where you last saw the light. Go to the place. Go to the place. What place, Jesus? Go, go to the sycamore tree. Go to the Cabarita headland. Go to the beach. Go to the sanctuary. Go to your closet. You've got to get back to the place because you need to return and be healed. Go to the place where you last saw the light. If you're surrounded by darkness, where was the place that you last saw the light? Rest in Christ's love and under his protecting care when sin struggles for the mastery in the heart. When guilt oppresses the soul and burdens the conscience, when unbelief clouds the mind, remember that Christ's grace is sufficient to subdue sin and banish the darkness. Entering into communion with the Savior, we enter the region of peace. Communion. You can have communion with God at the tippy end of the Cabarita headland. You can have communion with God in a sycamore tree. You can have communion with God wherever. Where's the place? Where's the place that in your early conversion, in your early experience, man, you had that place. It was you and Jesus. You weren't just available to be counted for. Here, here, present. Ah, oh, you were available. And not for God to perform some kind of a magic trick, some little sign. You were available. You were available for obedience. You were available to God. It's, man, Things have gotten harder, and no, they've not gotten harder. You've just become less available. Go back to the place where you last saw the light, she says, the place of availability. And here's where the appeal is. Here's where the altar call is. I'm going to save myself the humiliation of describing in detail why and how I need to return. I'll spare me, and I'll spare you. But suffice it to say, 
When I made myself available to God in that moment, maybe it was the jet lag in combination with the little mini miracle, in combination with the rising sun and the swimming dolphins and all of that, but the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, David, I got, I got, I got, I got some stuff I need to talk to you about. This isn't going to be a quickie. This isn't going to be an open up the Bible. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Close the Bible, and I'm off to the races. I'm Pastor David. This is the Spirit of God saying, David, we're going to have a conversation here. We're going to have a conversation about your availability. I could ask you some questions, David. Now, of course, God's not speaking to me audibly. He doesn't have to. He has a much more effective way of speaking. He just speaks right to my heart. He's got a direct, he's got a direct line of communication, and he, he starts revealing areas, situations, habits in my life where my availability has gone down and I'm less available to God than I was shortly after my conversion. And, and Jesus says to me, David, I need you to come back to that place of availability. I need you to come back to that place where you're not just here episodically. I, I need you to be in, th in that place. That place. Remember those great times we had? Remember that time we had? We haven't had one of those times. I need you to come back to that place, David. The sycamore tree. The headland. The bedroom closet. The beach walk. The mountaintop. I need, I, I, need, I need you to come back to that place. I need you to come back to the place of obedience, David. Not the place of you'll think about it and get back to me. I just need you to come back to that place of where when you hear, you do, and you figure out the understanding later. I need you to come back to that place, not where understanding, uh, obedience follows understanding, but to the place where understanding follows obedience. I need you to come right back to that place where I say something and you don't question it. I just say it and you say, you're my God, you're my Father, you love me, you're my King, and yes, yes, I'm going to do that. And David, you know, you and I both know, David, that when you were in that place of immediate ob obedience, your life was better. You know that. Yeah, you're right, Father. Yeah, you're right. Jesus, I, I, David, Jesus said to me, David, I need you to come back to that place of understanding. How are you going to get to the place of understanding? You're going to get to the place of understanding by being in the place of availability, by being in the place of obedience. I need you to come back to the place of peace. I tell you, man, religion cannot bring peace. But Jesus can. Let's pray together. Let's pray as a community. Let's pray as people in need of healing. Father in heaven.